Welcome to Bitcoin Tech Talk number 239. Today's episode is Resisting the Siren Song of Old Coins. As usual, my newsletter is published at jimmysong.substack.com. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And I will be reading this through uh, today. All right. Everyone has that friend that brags about their altcoin gains. Sure, they're currently called DeFi tokens and NFTs instead of ICOs and IEOs, but the dynamic is the same. Such people are enthused because some to coin they bought a few months ago has made them a lot of money, at least on paper. They talk about their massive gains on their trades and don't really care to tell you about anything else. It's annoying, vapid, and tempting. Every alt season repeats the same pattern. There's a celebration among the altcoiners, not because they've endured through the bear market as Bitcoiners have, but because they've made money trading something new. Despite the complete lack of technical understanding, market incentives, or even what the coin or product is supposed to do, they seem to make money hand over fist. There's a huge temptation to start trading and make some extra Bitcoin and glory in your riches. This is what I call the siren song of all coins, and I'm here to help you resist that temptation. I'm going to give you three reasons why you shouldn't be playing at the altcoin casino. The first reason to not trade is because most people are bad at trading. Making some money initially does not make you a good trader. Good traders consistently make money over a period of years. They usually have a proprietary system and are extremely disciplined. Most traders I know are watching the market constantly and usually trade many times a day, usually returning to a cash position before going to sleep. The bad traders are like bad poker players. They are at the table to get lucky and play anything and everything hoping to hit the jackpot. Instead of looking at the right signals to get in and get out, they go by feel and they lose money. In traditional markets, bad traders consist of about 90% while the good ones consist of about 10%. In crypto, my trader friends estimate that the ratio is around 99% and 1%. Trading, like anything, is a lot of work requiring study, analysis, and discipline. You don't make money without putting in the time and effort. In other words, it's a job, and there's significant opportunity cost in trading and not doing something you happen to be good at. The second reason is taxes. Every sell order is a taxable event. Not only is this extremely draining on your bottom line, but it's ridiculously hard to keep track of and a big headache. The general rule of thumb, at least in the U.S., is that you have to beat Bitcoin by at least 40% to make money trading. What's worse, you may owe taxes even if you lost money overall. So not only is trading a hard job that's hard to win at, but it's also heavily disincentivized. The third reason is that trading forms terrible habits. As my father told me years ago, the best thing that can happen to you the first time you go into a casino is to lose a little bit of money. This is because losing a little bit sets up the right expectations. The house wins over the long term, and the earlier you learn that, the better it is. Winning a bit or winning a lot unfortunately sets the wrong expectations, causing many people to get addicted to gambling and lose a lot more over the long term. In the same way, people who make money on their first few altcoin purchases are setting themselves up for long-term failure. They will think of themselves as geniuses who foresaw the rise of an altcoin before the market did. They will chase altcoins with similar characteristics, ultimately losing a lot of money against Bitcoin going forward. Altcoin sirens have swallowed many would-be traders since their inception in 2011. The key to resisting them is to focus on long-term value. Bitcoin has proven its use case. It's easy to see why we need it and why the world will need it. Such is not the case for all coins, most of which are understood by only a handful of people. Think long-term. What will be around five years from now? This is the defense against the long-term wreckage of all coining. So I wrote this article um, as uh, as sort of like a, a way to warn you against what's going to happen uh, in the next 12 months, uh, because we are in a very frothy altcoin bubble. Uh, the prices that you're seeing on a lot of this stuff, uh, particularly Doge, is not sustainable. I mean, maybe it'll, it goes higher, but, you know, two years from now, it's you're going to see some serious, serious crashing. 
Now you could get in and out before then, but that sets you up for very bad habits. Um, and you're probably going to have some tax liabilities that you're not going to be happy with. And more than that, it's going to get you used to trading and thinking that trading is always going to make money and you're going to be chasing after these gains. Instead, just hold Bitcoin. That's my recommendation. All right, let's look at some Bitcoin stories. Casa has published a practical overview of Taproot and what it can do. They focus mostly on the benefits to multi-sig, which is what they specialize in. Lower fees, better backups, 3F5 that degrades to 205 after X years and so on, and better privacy are some they point out. In addition, there's a bit of education there as well, explaining how Taproot works. Worth reading, especially if you're a Casa customer. So um, there's a bunch of articles. This is the first of two that I put in my newsletter about the benefits of Taproot, and they're making it much more practical there. Uh, and uh, degrading uh, multi-sig, I think, is fantastic. You could do that right now, but you only reveal the branch that you're um, degrading to uh, in uh, in Taproot, whereas with, uh, you know, something like the, uh, the current one, you have to reveal all of the branches. The Trezor blog explains how Taproot benefits hardware wallets in particular. In particular, the benefits of Schnorr are explored with regard to the processing time being drastically reduced, especially for large transactions. There's also a bit on the fee exploit that some hardware wallets may be vulnerable to which Taproot patches as well. For hardware engineers that have to work in very constrained environments, this is a great overview of some of the benefits. So uh, Schnorr is a lot less um, processor intensive. It's, ac it's actually older than ECDSA, which is what Bitcoin uses. Uh, a lot of, uh, something that a lot of people don't know is that Schnorr was under patent when Bitcoin was invented, which is why so it's speculated that Satoshi went to ECDSA. Uh, but uh, now that the Schnorr patent has expired, uh, we can bring Schnorr in and we don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, and it brings a lot of benefits like signature aggregation and things like that. Uh, but also, you know, uh, faster processing times. It, it's easier to calculate a Schnorr signature and verify it. Uh, than it is an ECDSA signature. Antoine Riard discloses a minor vulnerability for RBF transactions. Specifically, this is in reference to child transactions of an RBF transaction that doesn't signal replace by fee. Technically, as long as a parent mempool transaction signals RBF, the child should be replaceable, but currently, that is not the behavior of core nodes. This could be problematic in that an attacker can pin any parent RBF transaction by putting a child transaction that doesn't signal RBF. There are some implications for Lightning in particular. Note the defect has currently not been patched, but it isn't considered that big a deal. So this was put on the dev mailing list, um, and there are certain ways in which it can get um, abused later. Uh, but it's a, it's a very particular use case and a very particular type of attack, so they didn't feel the need to patch it right away. There's a new multi-sig guide that goes step-by-step step and is very user-friendly. You still need to be an intermediate or advanced user, but the steps are pretty straightforward and teaches the considerations to take into account when doing multi-sig. The process starts with shopping for components and goes through setup, sending, receiving, and practicing recovery. Worth going through if you're wanting to upgrade to multi-sig. So um, I think that's going to be the new um, uh, the new thing that I'm going to recommend for people that are interested in multi-sig. It is very useful um, and hopefully it can be um, uh, it can get more people to do multi-sig. All right, let's talk about lightning. Lisa Nagut celebrates the first dual-funded channels being opened using C Lightning. As she explains, dual-funded channels make the Lightning network more efficient. Blockstream has made a Lightning node available that will automatically accept dual-funded channels that match whatever liquidity you provide. This is a great model for inbound liquidity, as so much of the problem currently is that inbound liquidity is hard to get. So inbound liquidity is extremely difficult at the moment. Um, uh, because it it's kind of like a line of credit that someone is issuing you and they, they have markets for that and stuff. 
with dual funding, you have an equivalent amount or an asymmetric amount or whatever, uh, but it should, at least in theory, be a lot easier to, uh, you know, make, uh, uh, you know, these dual funded channels uh, and that will make the Lightning Network a lot more robust. Vlad Castilla gives an easy to follow explanation of the Lightning Network and the various options for running a node. He goes through some of the better all-in-one options like MyNode, BTC, and Nodal, but also goes through how to set one up for yourself. This, there's a nice explanation of what channels are and how the different Lightning clients differ. Um, yeah, so very good uh, sort of overview of your options if you want to run a Lightning node for the practical user. Um, I recommend that article uh, for that as well. Jameson Lop has a guide on how to connect to the Lightning Network using only Tor. He goes through setting up Bitcoin Core on Tor, setting up Lightning on Tor, and setting up your phone to interface with the node you just set up. This is great for privacy-conscious people who want to do Lightning the right way. Uh, so he wanted to set something up for himself where he could have a Lightning node that he can use with his phone and stuff. I think he ended up using Zeus because that's the only one that can phone home to his Lightning node at home and spend that. Um, so really cool stuff. Um, I, I might have to set something like that up uh, in a bit. Economics, engineering, etc. Uh, Lynn Alden has written a long article on inflation. Beware, this is very long and really should be a book. <laughs> She covers all the different measures of inflation, what CPI is, who it benefits, and the controversy surrounding it. Just to be clear, there's nothing about Bitcoin in there, but the shenanigans of fiat money point to why Bitcoin is superior. I thought she was too generous in assessing the current system, but there's a lot of good stuff in there on how inflation is measured. So a very thorough article from Lynn Alden. It has like nine different parts. Um, it was on, at the top of Hacker News yesterday, which is how I found out about it. A very good article props to Lynn um, and you know she she's obviously been into Bitcoin for a while now and uh, worth reading in full uh, even though it's like 9500 words. Pratik Gura analyzes Bitcoin in terms of Schumpeter's business cycle theory. There are three different cycles of varying lengths that Schumpeter identifies which Pratik explains and puts in context to Bitcoin. The juggler cycle in particular was pretty insightful and shows how Bitcoin really does seem to be driving innovation in various areas. So um, there's three cycles and uh, basically Pratik matches those cycles to what's happening in Bitcoin. The shortest one is on a per having cycle. Uh, the juggler cycle is more sort of like an innovation cycle that happens every decade. And like uh, the last cycle, which I can't remember its name, is all about uh, sort of like you know, different systems coming into play. And he thinks that Bitcoin is that new system. So uh, really good article. Uh, and at, at least it gave me insight into how innovation, Bitcoin is affecting innovation, uh, especially in ASICs and so on. Um, and as Pratik speculates, probably in the energy market next. Peter St. Ong uh, argues that fiat money turns a parasitic government into a predatory one. His argument is that governments have to collect taxes, uh, that have to collect taxes are aligned with the interests of the citizens, although imperfectly. When fiat money enters the picture, governments no longer listen to the citizens and just take resources through money printing. The analysis of fiat money in Song China is spot on and is to my and my ancestors eternal shame. So that last uh, comment is, of course, based on the fact that um, my last name is Song and I am supposedly descended from Song China, um, even though I'm Korean. Uh, but yeah, that uh, it's the whole um, analysis of fiat money and how it uh, sort of unlinks the government's interest with the citizens is really insightful, worth reading as well. Robert Breedlove continues his Sovereignism series writing about violence. The essay explores different game theory around violence given the different technologies available. Bitcoin certainly changes the game as securing Bitcoins is a lot less expensive than securing a physical asset. Violence is not nearly as effective against Bitcoin as it is against physical assets. For those wanting personal sovereignty, the role of technology as laid out in this essay is one to take seriously. And I, I thought that was the main insightful thing out of that essay is that te te technology really changes the equation, uh, the game theory equation in terms of 
um, you know, whether violence is worth it. Uh, be, uh, with physical things, violence often tends to be worth it if you own enough gold and so on. With Bitcoin, because it's not physical, it's uh, first of all hard to locate, and second, hard to just take. Um, so, as a result of that, the the additional um, benefits of technology are that it's more securable and that that reduces violence essentially. So very good insight from Robert B. Love there. And energy industry blog deep, deep dives into Bitcoin and its implications for that industry. The biggest thing I got out of it was that the current markets for natural gas require a significant amount of infrastructure, which drilling sites are not equipped with. By taking the flaring energy, there's less emissions, more profitability, and better efficiency everywhere in the energy chain. The article shows how for people actually in the energy industry who know how everything works, Bitcoin is a huge plus, unlike the energy alarmists in the mainstream media. Uh, I, I would have put this tweet in there, but basically uh, I, I didn't know about it until this morning. Uh, I think Michael Saylor said that like we as a as a world, we generate like, 200,000, you know, I don't know, megawatts of energy or gigawatts of energy. Um, and we waste like uh, five, 50,000 of it. Uh, so one quarter of that energy just gets wasted. Bitcoin takes like 150 gigawatts or something like that. So a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, and it's actually probably turning the waste energy into productive energy. Um, and that's a very good thing. Uh, all those energy alarmists should be talking about the wasted energy instead. Quick hits. NYDIG and FIS are going to make Bitcoin available as an option in bank accounts. Now, I, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, uh, but apparently they're trying to bring Bitcoin into bank accounts. Uh, DCG is planning to purchase back shares of GBTC now that the spread is negative. The spread on GBTC got negative, so they're buying it back and basically selling the Bitcoin on the market. So they make money either way as long as the spread, uh, you know, they, they issue more shares when there's a, there's a premium and they buy it back when there's a negative premium, which is happening right now. Another week, another complicated smart contract gets exploited, this time for $30 million on Binance's chain. So, you know, that, that tends to happen. Yeah, sorry about that uh, for the people on uh, Twitter spaces. I guess I got logged out somehow. And anyway, I'm back. I have been recording, so we're, we're okay. All right, so some events that I'm going to be at, um, Bitcoin 2021, uh, that's June 4th and 5th. I will be speaking there. I, uh, there's also the Bitcoin Standard Conference, August 12th to 14th in Mexico. Um, I'm going to be doing my programming blockchain seminar of June 1st and 2nd in Miami. Um, and I will be raising rates on May 18th, and I will also announce some scholarships on that date if you apply for a scholarship. Um, there is a two-day seminar. The, oh, uh, there's another seminar August 10th and 11th in Mexico right before the Bitcoin Standard Conference, and, uh, and this is for programmers that want to learn about Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, apply for scholarships or sign up, you know, um, all good for me. On this week's uh, Bitcoin Fixes This, I talked to American Hoddle about film and entertainment. Uh, we talked about Hollywood, the expensive process for, for producing movies, and the role that money plays into the safe decisions for big budget projects. We also talked about the influencer economy, including YouTube and TikTok. So, yeah, so, some of the stuff that he revealed in that uh, um, interview were interesting about the film and, uh, you know, uh, entertainment industry uh he he went to film school he worked in that industry for a while so it, it was really interesting learning just how much of a role fiat money plays let's see i read last week's newsletter on clubhouse um i was on tone show i was on moore's law is dead i was on struggle to strength and uh and bethany hamilton gave us a shout out on her blog um about the new book, Thank God for Bitcoin. Of course, my other two books are The Little Bitcoin Book and Programming Bitcoin, which you can find on Amazon. Anyway, um, that is about it. 
I don't know why I'm not showing up here. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, that that's about it. Uh, yeah, Fiat the Linda S. This song is done.